This is the e-learning podcast, episode number 12. Students are starting to sniff commoditization. Mm. If, you, if you've got a shitty online learning experience, students are looking at how am I spending my money and quality pedagogy and that, that shape of the institution, the brand and my identity with it, that's going to be a necessary competing force if you want to work for the mindshare of students. Welcome to the e-learning podcast from LMSPulse.com. My name is Stephen Laddick, and I'm the director at LMS Pulse. My guest for today's episode is Kenneth Chapman of D2L, formerly Designed to Learn. D2L is the Canadian e-learning company behind Brightspace, one of the top players in what we call the LMS space race. We became very interested in D2L, which is one of the longest running e-learning journeys out there, when we learned about their approach to customer care and equity, community building, and their conscious efforts in accessibility. I strongly recommend you check out Kenneth's very relevant talk on preparing for the post-COVID new normal at the eLearning Success Summit. I'm sure you're going to enjoy listening to this enlightening conversation where Kenneth and I talk about how D2L approaches the future of work from a company that aims to be a part of a person's lifetime of learning. We talk about the challenges of scaling up a cloud operation, not just technically, but to make sure more people benefit, especially disadvantaged groups. We talk about the Brightspace community, which is a place open to everyone, regardless of your LMS, to find answers, share experiences, and exchange knowledge and resources. We also talk about why it's important for e-learning companies to meet people where they are, drawing lessons from their customer base, but also knowing how to apply this case by case. And then finally, we talk about why underestimating the last mile of the e-learning experience could be fatal to any e-learning provider. Students can just sniff out a poor online experience a mile away. But before we get started, a quick word from our sponsors. The e-learning podcast is sponsored by the e-learning success summit. Learn from more than 40 experts, how to teach, work, and learn online without being overwhelmed. Get your free ticket to the summit at elearningsuccesssummit.com and lmspulse.com, your best source for news, information, and resources for e-learning professionals for more than 10 years. Get our free roundup of the week's top news at lmspulse.com. Hi, Kenneth. Welcome to the show. Hi, Stephen. Good to be on again. Nice to talk yeah, to you. Yeah. It's great to see you again. Um, you know, we were talking, we, we got the privilege to talk uh, on the e-learning success summit a while ago. You, you focus mostly on accessibility. Uh, the last time we talked, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to our our conversation today. Where, where am I finding you sitting today? It looks like a little different place than last time. Yeah, home office. I'm not relegated into a different corner of the house. I'm in a, a worse part of the house now. <laughs> well, God knows what, but um, no, uh, doing well just outside of uh, Toronto, Ontario today. You know, one of the things I'm really excited after, you know, after a while is that I'm going to I'm going to release maybe a post that shows all of the different places where I've recorded the podcast and the ghetto <laughs> setup that I have, you know, like the virtual reality is absolutely a lifesaver for me. I'm um, totally fooled by your office space. Yeah. I feel like I need <laughs> some renos when I look at that. So, uh, so, you know, what, for those people who weren't in the success summit, um, you know, obviously they can go listen to your talk. It's still available. Uh, they can get a free ticket, but tell us who you are who you work for, uh, just give us, you know, give us the, the 60 seconds on, on, on who Kenneth is and, and D2L. Yeah, uh, so I work for, for D2L. Uh, we're a, a learning management system and an educational technology company uh, headquartered in, in Canada. Um, I'm the, the vice president of market research for D2L and I'm fortunate enough to be part of the, the founding team uh, at the company. So I actually started my career working on an LMS while finishing my undergrad on that LMS. Um, so I'd like to say I was raised by wolves within the, uh, the ed tech space. <laughs> that I, I don't, I don't have a good response for that raised by wolves. And, um, and how's the situation in, in Canada? I've been asking this about everybody just sort of give us the, you know, what's the temperature in Canada right now? Is everybody, is everybody relegated to the closet like you and I, are people going back to work or schools back in or what's, uh, and just yeah. for posterity, we're recording this in you know August 2020, early August right. 2020. That's really relevant right now. Yeah. When you talk about <laughs> where we're at. No, things are things are actually opening up um, pretty well. We've sort of got a mask mandate, and we're in what we'd call phase three. So pretty much every uh, area of the province that I'm in is open right now. Um, schools are talking about going back uh, full time, um, you know, with some some additional cleaning measures and, and distancing uh, measures in place, but. 
I think like anywhere, um, you know, to, to respond to people that have compromised uh, family members and, and other health concerns, there's a digital door to every classroom around here. Mm, mm. Yeah. And so now take me into how does that translate for D2L? Because, you know, there's new normal starting to forget, you know, and obviously physicality, you know, people are physically showing up everywhere. Um, the last time we talked, you know, earlier this year, you were drinking from a fire hose, too many you know, people were, you know, everybody was needing to get online, businesses, schools, et cetera, et cetera. Has your business started to slow down a little bit or is it just still like, holy smokes, every, you know, we, we, we don't have enough hands uh, to, to, to take care of every fire or what's it like? Yeah, it's, it's holy smokes. It's, uh, we're on fire. Uh, I mean, I think I mentioned this before, but thank goodness we went in the cloud when we did. Thank goodness we sort of fixed our, our user experience and our mobile piece. Um, mm -hmm. Those things were, were paramount, I think, for us being able to scale both, you know, just the technology that we're providing and the number of users, but also scale to the demographic of the types of teachers and faculty that we're now supporting. Mm. Thrust onto online, you mm. know, forced into it via chaos. And, you know, any barriers that a tool or technology puts in the way, you know, you're hurting people that way. So, yeah. so really happy that we had the technology and the, the product readiness. Um, as the pandemic first started rolling forward, we weren't really talking to a lot of new organizations. We were doing a lot of, you know, talking to our customers, turning our seat over and what do we do to help you? How do we help you get the most out of what you're doing? Where can we offload some of the help desk uh, requirements and things like that back to our people? You know, so your limited instructional design support staff can focus on pedagogy and the important stuff, not where do I click? Mm -hmm. um, what we're finding now is we're running out of hands for mm. instructional design consulting. We're running out of hands for content creation. We have a big part of our business is, is doing learning and creative services and, and sort of helping to show here's the art of the possible in an online environment. And here's how you can really personalize at scale. So that part of the business is, is crazy. And, and it's something that doesn't scale the same way that, that tech does. Yeah. I was that, And so that's a, that's a question. Sorry. To, I don't mean to cut you off, but oh, I, I was, is, it just sounds like the heavy lift was initially like, holy, you know, we're, you know, we got to figure out the tech. Like, yeah. like, how do I even just click to get the zoom moving and where do I put my classroom stuff? And like, everybody's online now, but has that completely shifted into pedagogy kind of like, how do I actually design a class? How do I, yeah. Uh, is, is that what it shifted to basically? We're yes to an extent and we're trying to shove it that way as well, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we're, what we're trying to do when we're creating some of our community enablement um, materials and, and things like that, you know, training and, and other stuff, webinars, videos, is, is trying to provide some lanes for faculty to work into, you know, like if, if all they've ever done is Google Classroom, you know, and they, they want to do more than a digital manila folder, here's how you go from Google Classroom into some of the basics of, of leveraging an LMS. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you have someone that's been doing a lot of synchronous work and, you know, a lot of their Zoom lectures and things like that, here's how you can start to rethink some of the ways you're offering that content. Here's how you can wrap some, you know, interaction with other learners. Here's how you can wrap some knowledge tests in there. And then, you know, there's the farther lanes that get into the, the good stuff, right? Like here's mm -hmm. how you really develop mastery learning type assessments. Mm -hmm. Here's mm -hmm. where you can help students bring in authentic evidence of demonstrating skill and um, so, so we're trying to sort of meet faculty and meet institutions where they are and sort of help give them some lanes that they can sort of level themselves up into and, and the right materials instead of, I'm sure you've seen, Stephen, like so many websites filled with great resources, but having to curate and pick through what's relevant for me is, is our customers told us that's one of the biggest challenges. Oh, yeah. Now. And that's, I, well, so the, you've, you've kind of stolen my thunder. My next question here is, is that, are you providing this just to your clients or is this something that, I mean... You could give a, you, you, is this a resource you're providing sort of writ large right now? Yeah, it's, it's open. Um, our, our Brightspace community is available for, for anybody to go uh, pull materials off of. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of it is specific to how do you address this pedagogy in our tool. Um, a lot of it is quite generic. Um, actually, as we speak, our users conference is going on right now, and that's typically just uh, D2L customers, but we've opened that up to the world at large. Um, so all of our sessions, all of our experts, all of our keynotes, um, you can just go to d2l.com slash fusion. Anybody can register. Um, everything's on demand. I prefer to watch things at 2x speed. So I'm getting my fusion done <laughs> sure. on like half speed. <laughs> no, it's handy. I mean, today we're, we've got people talking about strategies for data. Yesterday they were talking about competency-based education. So we're trying to make as much 
um, of the expertise we've got available to the whole community. Yeah. How is this? Do you feel like there's starting to be an acceptance? Like, I'm, I kind of want to talk about what's, you know, rather than having the podcast be about the same kind of conversation over and over again, like, what's the, what are you seeing as the future of not work, not work, not only for like a professor, but also take me to some of your corporate clients as well, where it's like the remote teams and these, is, yeah. is this, people are like, okay, hey, this is the new reality and I'm, I need to build these skills and that's who I'm going to become. Like this has been, or are, is there still a huge resistance? Where, what are you seeing from where you're at? I'm seeing, I'm really optimistic that I, I'm seeing um, a recognition that things are changing and a lot of the stuff we all talked about in conference hallways for years are, is starting to become a necessary reality. Um, mm. Corporate organizations that we talk to are, are starting to recognize that they need to start building up almost farm teams. You know, they need to look at how do they extend the, the reach that they have not only with their own employees, you know, we already knew, um, particularly um, younger folks going into the workplace, they expect to see their company investing in them. Right. And they expect to be able to apply that investment to things that are personally relevant for their career and socially relevant for how they want to, you know, make the world a better place, mm -hmm. um, which mm -hmm. is awesome, but a huge challenge for, for corporations. Um, we've also, we're also seeing uh, I think hey, before you, before you go down the next point, there, what do you mean by farm team? Like, I, I don't know if I completely understand. Like, like so, like outsourcing pieces or or having other like was building that mean? in building in um, um, deep partnerships into academic um, institutions um, into industry where they can grow up. Oh, I see what you. I'm sorry, skills. that was a nice yeah. little baseball reference there that I completely missed. <laughs> 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 you mean like actually sort of like hey, look here's our here's our here's our minor league team that we're starting to yeah. build up and then they're going to be, and we're going to be able to bring them into the core team and then like a management leadership track. And these are, exactly. this is like now a expected core skill set that they, they need to have. I get it. Yeah. We, we did some similar stuff at D2L with building up a data science team and, mm. and going into universities and saying, okay, let's sort of start to cultivate and curate the skills that we need to, to have addressable as a business. Mm. So I think a lot of, a lot of corporations are, are struggling with that. You know, they, mm. they need to upskill their, their workforce. They need to reskill them. They need to do it in, in really efficient ways. So there's a, there's a huge opportunity, I think right now, and, and academic organizations are re reflecting this too, to, to build some of those partnerships and, and to blur some of those lines, you know, mm. where, the, the degree program and, and all of the curriculum that, that, that uh, academic institutions have today can be repackaged, can be remixed, can be reoffered to be appropriate and specific to skills that, that industry is looking for. Mm. So it's a really exciting time as a technology provider because you start to think about how do I translate between you know, typically pretty verbose and, and, and um, widely built out academic outcomes and job skills, which are yeah. short, terse and addressable, right? Right, right. What was I going to say there? So what are, are you finding that, like, okay, so if I'm sitting in, you know, Acme Corporation 101, right? Or, or Acme, you know, not 101, that's a class. And, you know, what we're seeing right now, there's a big shakeout, right? Um, a lot of people are showing up and be like, oh, wait, hey, that team of 20 people that we have, we actually can do the work with five and, you know, we got to figure out what to do with the other 15 or vice versa. Um, are, are you starting to see a push or a, a real recognition that retraining and reskilling uh, staff, that's, I mean, that's, it, it seems to me, does, is that the right way to go? Or is it look at that farm team of, of real new fresh blood? Does, I, I, I'm just wondering, where does that sit in the, in the corporate mindset? I, I think it's both. I, I think, you know, when we're talking to a, a chief learning officer and we're talking to, to like a large, you know, global corporation, they're looking at both, right? They're looking mm -hmm. at, uh, you know, they recognize as well, the cost of acquisition is much higher than the, the cost of retention, even mm -hmm. with their own employees and the investment made into them. Um, you know, larger organizations are also thinking about, well, how do I deploy and extend my enterprise with some of the learning and training that I already have available? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, it's, it, it's a mix. I mean, I, I think a, a lot of organizations are, are focused more on how do I upskill and, and reskill my existing staff more than that, that farm team sort of analogy. Right. I think that applies more to your, you know, Fortune 1000s and, and larger organizations. And uh, maybe this will be a, a curveball for you, but do you have sort of like, hey, here's the first three things that you should do? Uh, you know, uh, to, to start upscaling your staff or, you know, like, or addressing the new reality is like, as you said, you're kind of curating all that content. Do you have that kind of thing that you could share with us or? 
Uh, it's really dependent. I mean, there the 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 diversity of of where our, our customers are is is all over the map. So we do a lot of trying to meet them where we they, where they are. Mm -hmm. When we start to see some signals of okay, here's some commonalities. You know, that's when we get a sense of great. We can build services or, or product that's specific to these things. Um, but no, I mean, in general, what we try to do is is leverage some of our strengths in the technology. So doing knowledge capture and allowing for anyone to to author. Uh, knowledge materials is, is mm -hmm. super helpful in, in that sort of upskilling and, and reskilling sort of mindset. Mm -hmm. Allow the subject matter experts of the company to capture, project, and share that knowledge and expertise so that others can can do the same. And it's 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 that kind of learning experience that we know people want, right? They want to be creators. They want to mm -hmm. be uh, interactive. They don't want to be consumers that way, particularly in in, um, in our work. And do you so? Okay, so then do you find that with clients, either academic or corporate? that Brightspace provides a, a great platform, but it's, it's always like, look, you've got to take this and customize it to what you need and tweak it and those kinds of, this isn't sort of, uh, and I don't want to belittle the, the technology or anything like that, but are you finding every, every experience is customized or are there sort of, you know, literally sort of, you know, click and play kind of solutions that are out there for you? Yeah, I mean, typically it's, it's click and play and, and the mindset we sort of take is crawl, walk, run. So, you know, we have a, we have a team that, that onboards and builds an implementation and a success plan. And typically what you'll see is you onboard within a typical configuration. You know, there's some, there's some guardrails most people sort of fall within. Um, as organizations get more sophisticated, as they get more advanced, they start to look at, okay, I want to try and do the following. And mm. um, we'll help them do that. But oftentimes they're building up that acumen and that skill set to do that themselves from there. Mm. So it's more, it, it's more to kind of have the uncarved block, but the flexibility to shape it and, and carve it out to, to be the image of the organization you want. I, you know, I need to hire you immediately. You have so many great turns of phrase and so many analogies. I just, I can't even compete. It's, that's fantastic. I love that sort of, here's your block of wood or your, your you know, and you're kind of carving it. Well, and, and sorry, Stephen, just to, I think that's something that organizations are really starting to think about, right? Students are starting to sniff commoditization. Mm. If you if you've got a shitty online learning experience, students are looking at how am I spending my money, and quality pedagogy and that that shape of the institution, the brand, and my identity with it, that's going to be a necessary competing force if you want to work for the mindshare of students. It's it's a well, it's you, a you, marketplace there. You took me there exactly because here's the thing: you give me a piece of wood or give me like. If I were an artist, I wouldn't do a very good job. Luckily, I'm in the tech space, so I you know I, I understand what. But we're moving to a point now very quickly where those expectations, I'm going to rephrase that actually, because here's what my intuition tells me. My intuition tells me that we normally make the assumption that younger people say, look, I expect a quality experience, right? I, I know what Snapchat is. I know what Facebook is. I know what Instagram is. And those are quality, easy to use, you know, great visually and emotionally pleasing experiences, right? That's what they want to see. But I'm going to just say, look, adults tell you know tell retirement age they want that as well yeah absolutely um, and even sometimes even more so right because they don't want to have to figure it out yeah right they want it to not only work but they want it to be accessible and easy yeah how Nobody's do we, more how do we with, sorry yeah no I was just, how do we start to make that move to quality like where is there a is there a way to to do you have any secrets for that? Or is it just, you know, you've got it, is it, is it an art form? Is it a talent or is there tricks, tips? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any, any bags under my eyes or wrinkles <laughs> I have is thinking about how do we make that, that level of quality. You, still look, you still look 26, come on, whatever. Right. That's because <laughs> Zoom's got the smoothing feature. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, we're, we're, we're talking and we're thinking a lot about that. And I think there's, you know, there's, if you look at the normal distribution curve, you got to sort of design for your educators and, and really embrace the fact that, most people are coming on at that first time use. You know, it, it used to be a normal distribution curve. Now it's kind of a chi squared because oh, yeah. everybody's coming in fresh, right? There's a lot of new new entrants, and that's both. It's a crisis opportunity, right? It's it's a crisis because you can turn people off online learning forever, um, but but it's an opportunity to onboard them and to show them there are ways to save time. The things that you know are important in engaging your students, you can achieve that level of engagement in an online environment not maybe the same way that you did, but different. Mm. So the way we look at that is ease of use is absolutely priority number one. Um, and I'm talking about for the educators, you know, they have to have that positive first use. 
they have to be able to get a job done and have that reward path go off. Um, and we, we take this idea when we're designing our product uh, to, around progressive disclosure. So once I've done something simply, once I've discovered, hey, here's how I create an assignment, give it a name, add a grade item, it's easy for me to discover, oh, well, I could differentiate this assignment for students that have shown an interest in this topic. Um, and we can sort of peel back another layer and expose them to more sophistication without overwhelming them up front. So we try mm -hmm. to take a, a graduated path towards more of those uh, adoption of some of those more quality or, or more sophisticated uh, activities. Ultimately, what, what my hypothesis is, I'm speaking for most people at D2L probably, <laughs> is that that context triangle, I think, is, is the most important thing. For every learning activity, what, is, what am I actually trying to assess? Uh, how am I going to assess this? And what is the outcome or the goal or the, the demonstrable? That, that context triangle of understanding those things is so critical to be able to set student expectation, to be able to enable alternative representations, alternative um, demonstration models, to enable machine learning and recommendations, you have to know the why. So when we're thinking about how we design really quality uh, online learning environments, a lot of it is how do we help faculty capture that context trial tri triangle, that why, so they can look at how do I deploy the types of learning experiences that get the students there. Mm. I hope that makes sense. It's totally, it totally makes sense. I love it. And um, I want, I'm, I'm trying to wonder if I can peel the onion there a little bit where, and, and I never had asked this question is the, the big fail that we've been hearing about through the whole crisis is, you know, take your class or take your training and just, you know, make a PowerPoint out of it, put that there and then make a, you know, and then invite everybody, everybody to do a zoom and, you know, bore the tear, you know, bore everybody to tears over an hour and a half every day. Um, we've now moved into much more asynchronous stuff. Is that, I mean, I guess the question is, is it inevitable? Are we going to find ourselves going to that, look, here's the micro learning, here's the pieces of actual kernels of knowledge. And then it's the culturalization of, how do we bring this together as a team? How do we, how do we, you know, how do we translate this as our brand? Uh, yeah. Is that, is that where the art form is? I think so. And I, and I think that's true for some. Um, I, I think for others, they're going to be happy with their hour and a half of, of Zoom meetings. And, mm. and if that's the case, give them that choice to do it. Um, I, I think the key is, is in looking at the, you know, the, the breadth of the, I'm going to come back to accessibility. Sure. You know, when, you, when you look at how you're designing and, and trying to build a system to support each and every learner, that implies you have a broad definition of accessibility and it's, it's a design principle up front. And in doing that, you're not creating more work for yourself. Um, you're, you're simply mindfully preparing each student to have, you know, a path that's going to make sense to them and, and for them to be able to demonstrate and, and engage. Mm. Um, the trick there is, is, you know, you got to get to, you got to get to faculty. That's a, a lot of work for them. They need a lot of help and they're not all trained educators, right? There's only so many instructional designers to go around. Do you guys work in the, the, the K through 12 space a lot? We do. Yeah, actually, we uh, one of the biggest uh, upticks we saw in our business over COVID, um, really where we were winning a lot of new um, customers was with schools. Mm. Um, so we have a, a, an interface for Brightspace that's meant for early learners. Um, mm -hmm. So it's all icon based. It's, it's meant uh, not to require reading. You know, there's little capture apps that you can, you know, grab a big iPad yeah. and take a picture of what you're working on. Um, we've seen a huge uptick in, in usage for, for early learners. Uh, my five-year-old uses Brightspace. Yeah, I was just, I was just say, so um, for those people who've been listening for a while, they, they, they know, um, you know, we're in transition to a new country and all, you know, I've got three children and they have literally, you know, as we're recording this, you know, 36 hours ago started with a new school online. Uh, I got to say, I'm, I'm pleased as a parent, but also, hey, I'm, I'm a professional in this industry. It, the, the school really prepared right? The teachers yeah. were prepared and the experience for each, the, the one thing that I would tweak was that, is that the experience for each child could be tweaked a little better, right? My six-year-old needs that icon, right? They need, yeah. she needs the seesaw or the bright space or the whatever, where it's like, hey, push here, capture right. what I'm doing here. That, um, whereas my 12-year-old, he needs Google Classroom, he needs to read, he needs videos, those kinds of things. Um, and, and just sort of that art form, once again, of knowing your audience and knowing where to meet them. It's just so very interesting to me, the, the skill set that's going to be required for teachers uh, in order to, to move that forward. So is that a part of your, 
is that a part of the curated learning that you have in, in your Brightspace, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, learning environment you have now? Yeah, that's what we're trying to support as much as possible. And, and I mean, that's where we build listening channels in with our customers to understand, you know, some of them are, are doing um, enablement and training for thousands of teachers themselves too. Um, right in my backyard of Ontario, you know, there's, I think there's 70 some odd school boards that the, the province is supporting. So when we talk back to the province, we, we get lots of great information on, okay, how do we take some of the materials they've built, bring that in ourselves and, and generalize that so they can support, you know, any equals many uh, customers and, instead of one. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting, like different, different individuals have totally different um, experiences with, the, with online. I mean, my, my 11 year old doesn't want to go back to the classroom. She misses her friends deeply, but she feels a sense of accomplishment of, of having a checklist online and seeing it done. Wow. And she's getting her stuff done in three hours. Um, so See, my 12, my 12 year old is exactly the opposite. He cannot get this finished with soon enough. Like he just misses being in the melee, you know, like yeah, my eight year old's the same way. Yeah. Get me back <laughs> in the classroom. Yeah. <laughs> really interesting. Talk to me about video quality. Um, mm -hmm. Have, as you've seen now over the last four months or so, everybody's got to be online. Everybody's, you know, uh, got different backgrounds and different, you know, just, you know, some people are, they know how to position the camera, this and that. How critical is that to be able to, both on the learner and the presenter side? Is yeah. that, is that, to me, it seems like that's like 99% of the experience. Really? I'm yeah. Really that's interesting. Okay. I don't have, well, I, and, and I'll make the case. I'll make you tell me if I'm wrong, but I'll make the case is that I have now seen just so many different iterations of zoom meetings or, or Google classroom meetings or whatever, where the teacher just has it together or the presenter has it together. Yeah. yeah. They don't have to have like a background like mine and whatnot, like, but, but they look nice. They're well positioned. They're in the center of the screen. They, yeah. they you know, they're interacting, you know, kind of like this, you know, they're not, re, you know, and it just changes my willingness to participate and pay attention. Whereas right. when you're in one of those places where people are off to the side or you're, I'm looking up your nose, it just, I'm, I don't want to be there. <laughs> you think, have, you, have you done any, have, have any feedback on that? Are you done any research there? Qualitatively, yeah. We've, we've been asking around about that. Um, I, think it's, I think there's a quantum level of quality you got to get to. And below that threshold, there's nothing, right? And, and so it's, it's work, 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 work. And then it's all up here. It's all up here. Right? Like, and I don't, <laughs> I don't think the bar's that high, right? Like, get your dog out of the room and not barking <laughs> is the key one. Um, yeah, like up the nose is, is not cool. Um, but, but generally what we found is, uh, and I think this has changed over the pandemic, there's, a, there's, an exception, there's an acceptance that a little bit of laundry pile behind you, you know, a little bit of shaky camera and, and stuff, creates a bit sense of vulnerability. You know, we're, we're in this together. Touché. Touché. Um, yeah. I think where that adds up is where you start doing things that, um, that are sort of counter to what you want pedagogically, which is a half hour long Zoom lecture or an mm. hour long, those start to add up, right? If you're mm. keeping things at the, the 10 minute mark, um, you know, that's, uh, I think that's, it's less of an additive sort of effect. The other part I would say is part of video quality is captioning. That's where one we're seeing is captioning is absolutely critical to have as part of video quality, whether you're doing it synchronously or, or asynchronously. Um, so we've been trying to do a lot to see how we can support captions going into the, uh, into the environment because there's a situational accessibility issue. If it's loud, if my kids are distracting me, I can't always hear what's going on in the video, but I can follow the caption. Right. And so, and, and I love it when somebody catches me off guard. What do you use for synchronous captioning? Uh, so Zoom has uh, uh, Otter AI. We've been uh, we've mm -hmm. been leveraging that. Uh, Otter IO or AI. Those are different companies. One of those Otter is, something. <laughs> yeah, one of those is the captioning company. So I run an accessibility advisory board, and there are um, we've got sign language interpreters in there. We've got people that are uh, uh, sight impaired, hearing impaired. So that's sort of been my test bed for how good that captioning works, and it's been getting mm. thumbs up so far. Super. Um, and then built into our platform, we use some of the Amazon Web Services to automatically capture or caption any of the videos that are done through webcam. So that's one of the things we've been trying to encourage is, yeah, you were good at talking head in Zoom for half hour. Just capture yourself in the LMS, do it 10 minutes, cut it into three points. You're done. You don't have to go and do it again. You can point your students to it. You can wrap a learning activity around it. And it's a resource that they can go back to, not into the ether. Right, right. Absolutely. You know, you've, I, I really appreciate you taking the time today. I know you're a super busy guy. Final question is, you know, 
is there any super, you know, important piece of advice that you'd give to people who are listening right now? Is like either the classic fails or the classic successes where it's just like, hey, don't do this or, you know, uh, try A, B, and C. And that, that's going to really up your game in the quality world. Empathy. Uh, I, I think empathy is number one. Think about um, what your, your actual student experience is. Think about what they're trying to accomplish, the constraints and the barriers that they're under. And if in doubt, talk to them and, and ask them about their experience. Ask them what engages them. Um, be human with each other. You know, when we're putting a, a technology between us, that's, that's more important than ever. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're going to design human and, and real learning experiences, we have to understand each other as humans, I think. I love it. Kenneth, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. I wish you all the luck. I'm going to definitely try to follow up with you in about six months to see where D2L is at. We'll go from Please there. Please do. Always a pleasure, Stephen. Thank you. Thanks again for tuning into today's episode of the eLearning Podcast. If you like what you've learned uh, today in this episode, I encourage you to either follow us or subscribe to us on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube. And please do share this episode with one or two of your colleagues or friends. Also, I just want to remind you that you can level up your online learning game with all of the information that's available at the eLearning Success Summit. You can get your free ticket at eLearningSuccessSummit.com. And finally, you can also stay up to date on everything that's important, all the news and the resources for e-learning professionals at lmspulse.com. Get our free newsletter by just going to lmspulse.com today. Thanks again.